In the crazy world of TikTok, challenges light up the platform, offering an exciting way for users to showcase their talents and connect with a global community, all at the tap of their phones. But within this exhilarating landscape hides a darker reality where challenges can take a perilous turn, where kids are risking their lives for fame. Jacob Stevens was a lively 13-year-old from Ohio and an avid TikTok user. His journey took a turn for the worst when he encountered the famous Benadryl challenge he found on TikTok. In the confines of his home, Jacob, along with friends, decided to participate in this risky trend. Ignoring safety regulations and the instruction label on the packaging, he ingested a staggering 12 to 14 Benadryl pills, hoping to induce hallucinations. The repercussions were swift and severe. Jacob, in the midst of friends recording the challenge, experienced seizures and was rushed to the hospital. He spent an agonizing six days connected to a ventilator in intensive care, only for doctors to deliver the devastating news that he would never wake up and was suffering from critical brain damage. TikTok set the stage for these challenges and responded with a claim that they had never witnessed such content trends. Searches related to the challenge were supposedly blocked for years, yet skepticism lingers given the platform's history with risky challenges. TikTok expressed sympathy for Jacob's family and stressed its commitment to stricter content guidelines. Inadvertently, Benadryl, an over-the-counter antihistamine created to relieve allergy symptoms, found itself entangled in this grim trend. Acknowledging the danger, Johnson & Johnson collaborated with TikTok to purge the content. Amid grief, Jacob's father, Justin Stevens, transformed his pain into advocacy, urging age restrictions on medications and seeking support from Ohio Governor Mike DeWine. Nick, an impressionable young 12-year-old from Miami, came across the fire challenge on TikTok, ignoring the potential risks and excited to have some fun in his grandmother's backyard. He learned a tragic and unforgettable lesson about fire safety. It was the day of October 7, 2020, and the day after his granddad's passing, grief and anxiety was possibly still in the air, maybe a little ignorance too. Nick was hanging out on the back porch at his grandmother's house with his younger brother and cousins. While the adults were in another room, the kids were chatting about TikTok videos, including one showing the fire challenge, where a teen lights objects on fire after dousing them with accelerant. Curious, 11-year-old Nick saw a lighter and decided to give it a try. His own words were as follows. I poured a little bit of rubbing alcohol on the concrete floor, lit it and put it out. But I guess the bottle had caught on fire and it exploded. I started burning. Panicked and in excruciating pain, Nick ran to where all the adults were, in the front of the home hoping that someone could spear him of his misery. Luckily enough, a quick-thinking uncle of Nick's had the idea to spray him with water from a nearby hose. This water helped with the flames and stopped the burning temporarily, but the damage was irreversible. Nick's worried family managed to find a police officer at a nearby school, and he was swiftly airlifted to HCA Florida Kendall Hospital. Nick spent an excruciating six months in and out of hospital, vital time he could have used playing with friends. Instead, learning how to walk and dress himself. He underwent 50 surgeries, the burns so deep and severe that they damaged the nerves in his legs. It was horrible, says his mother, Estella Guillen. It was heartbreaking, devastating and traumatic. The Skullbreaker Challenge. This challenge involves three people. Well, two people who are aware of the challenge and one unsuspecting victim. The challenge involves two people approaching the victim and asking them how high they can jump. When they jump, the two people kick their legs from beneath them so they fall back onto their head. Unlike the other challenges, this challenge is very intentional when it comes to inflicting harm to the victims immediately. Emanuela Medeiros, a 16-year-old Brazilian girl, was in the trustful presence of her friends on the day of the 11th of November 2019. Not suspecting anything dangerous to happen or to be pranked by those closest to her, she was also asked how high she could jump as her friends attempted the dangerous skullbreaker challenge with her. 
The tragedy happened at the Antonio Fagundes Municipal School in Mossoró, Brazil. She fell back as intended, and she hit her head, friends probably laughing and excited that they had managed to prank someone, did not know or could predict the events about to transpire. The school took her to the regional hospital Tarcisio Maia in the Aeroporto district, but sadly she passed away. Imagine your child simply attending school to learn and make friends, and you get the heartbreaking news that the school has taken them to the hospital, and you will never see them again. Something no parent would ever want to experience. The Blackout Challenge, known also as the Pass Out Challenge and the Fainting Game, Participants have to find a way to become unconscious by using household objects. The blackout challenge had been around before TikTok and just gained relevancy again within this new app designed for teenagers. The challenge has resulted in the deaths of between 15 and 20 children. Milagros Soto, a 12-year-old girl from Argentina, attempted the TikTok challenge on January 13, 2023, with dire consequences. Milagros attempted the blackout challenge with a rope round her neck and holding her breath. She was at her home and apparently received a link from one of her classmates via WhatsApp Messenger. When she attempted the blackout challenge, she was live streaming to her friends. Suffocating second by second, she struggled to remove the rope three times from around her neck as each second she was closer to death. She failed and her life slipped away in the presence of her friends on a live stream. Her father found her dead in her bedroom as he arrived home from work. Her aunt believes that there was more to this accident, and she may have been lured into a trap by bullies at her school, as she had complained about being ridiculed by classmates. A copy of the autopsy indicated that Soto's death was caused by mechanical asphyxia by hanging, and that there are no signs of abuse or third-party intervention. Authorities recovered Soto's cell phone, and are investigating if any of the students at the school were involved in the deadly challenge. We are in a world where more and more generations are exposed to the negative effects of social media trends, and it is our job as parents and the community to guide our children to more meaningful and educational resources. As when push comes to shove, we the parents and the community have to grieve the loss of our loved ones, and lawsuits cannot fill the loss of our loved ones completely. In the small town of Konotop, Ukraine, a 25-year-old chemistry student, Vladimir Likonos, met his demise in a shocking accident involving his favorite pastime, chewing gum. Known for his passion for science and penchant for experimenting with various chemicals, Vladimir, a student at the Kiev Polytechnic Institute, was back home for the holidays, spending much of his time on his computer and delving into his studies. Opting for his favorite pastime, he unknowingly dipped his chewing gum into an unidentified explosive powder, which he had been using for his chemistry experiments. The explosive, later revealed to be four times more potent than TNT, bore an uncanny resemblance to the citric acid Vladimir, commonly used to enhance the sour taste of his gum. The explosion that followed was devastating blowing off half of Vladimir's face, including his jaw. Emergency services, though summoned promptly, were unable to save him. The explosive, discovered to be exceptionally potent, raised chilling questions about the circumstances surrounding Vladimir's death. Investigators found about 100 grams of the mysterious explosive powder on Vladimir's work table highlighting the possibility that he had mistakenly confused it with the innocuous citric acid. Friends and classmates, still reeling from the shock, shared anecdotes of Vladimir's love for science, revealing a young man who dreamed of becoming a scientist. The aftermath of the incident left both the community and law enforcement grappling with the mysterious nature of the explosive substance. The explosion, triggered by Vladimir's unsuspecting chewing of the gum, raised speculation about whether it was catalyzed by the chemical reacting with his saliva or the pressure exerted as he chewed on the deadly mixture. As authorities conduct further tests to unravel the intricacies of this tragic event, 
Conotop remains haunted by the unforeseen consequences of a young scientist's experiment gone horribly wrong. Extreme sports push the boundaries of physical and mental limits, offering an adrenaline-fueled escape from the ordinary. Whether soaring through the air in wingsuits, conquering treacherous mountain slopes, or riding powerful waves, participants embrace the thrill of danger with a passion for the extraordinary. Eric Rohner's journey began on November 2, 1976, in the vibrant city of San Francisco, California. Rona made a mark not only as an athlete, but also as an actor. His notable appearances included the Nitro Circus Series, 2006, One for the Road, 2011, and Light the Wick, 2010. On a fateful morning in Olympic Valley, California, the sunlit sky served as a backdrop for the daring feats of MTV star and extreme sports enthusiast Eric Rona. Little did the more than 100 spectators know that this picturesque setting would bear witness to tragedy. As part of a three-man parachute team performing at the fourth annual Squaw Valley Institute Celebrity Golf Classic, Rona's descent took an unexpected turn. Off target and veering dangerously close to the tree line, he collided with a tree in a moment that would forever alter the course of the day. Eyewitnesses, including Roy Tuscany, founder of the non-profit sports injury group, the High Fives Foundation, were among 120 individuals for the charity golf tournament. Tuscany recounted the impact, describing how Rona struck the tree with such force that the aftermath was a painful unknown. The aftermath revealed a scene of both chaos and grief. Rona, entangled high above the ground, became the focus of a rescue effort that would tragically prove futile. Despite the swift response of rescue personnel, the announcement at the scene bore the weight of a life cut short. The sun painted the morning sky with hues of gold as 13-year-old Bethany Hamilton embarked on a routine surfing adventure along Tunnels Beach, Kauai, on the day of October 31, 2003. Accompanied by her best friend Alana Blanchard and Alana's father and brother, the waves whispered promises of exhilarating joy. As Hamilton floated on her surfboard, engaged in light-hearted banter with Alana, the tranquility of the morning shattered. A 14-foot-long tiger shark emerged from the depths, its sudden attack leaving chaos in its wake. With a swift and brutal force, the predator seized Hamilton, biting off her left arm just below the shoulder. In the face of unimaginable terror, Alana and her family rallied, paddling Hamilton back to the safety of the shore. Alana's father, driven by a father's love and an urgency born of crisis, fashioned a tourniquet from a rash guard, staunchly wrapping it around the stump of Hamilton's arm. The race against time began as they rushed Hamilton to Wilcox Memorial Hospital. By the time she reached the hospital, Hamilton had lost over 60% of her blood, succumbing to hypovolemic shock. Fate had interwoven the destinies of Hamilton and her father that day, for he was scheduled for knee surgery, the operating room awaiting him. Yet, it was Hamilton who took her place on the operating table, facing the daunting task of recovery. In the aftermath of the attack, a family of fishermen, led by Ralph Young, provided investigators with a grim piece of evidence, a 14-foot-long tiger shark they had caught and killed, its mouth bearing surfboard debris. Measurements confirmed it was the same predator that had struck Hamilton. The sea, which had once been her playground, had become the stage for a harrowing encounter that tested her resilience. Undeterred by the trauma, Hamilton's spirit remained unbroken. Just a month after the vicious attack, she defied the odds, returning to the waves that had both betrayed and nurtured her. A custom-made board, longer and thicker, equipped with a handle for her right arm, became her ally as she navigated the waves with determination. With steely resolve, Hamilton taught herself to surf with one arm. The healing power of the ocean embraced her once more, and by January 10th, 2004, she fearlessly entered her first major competition. 
The shark-bitten surfboard, a haunting relic of that dreadful encounter, and the swimsuit gifted by ocean photographer Aaron Chang, now find a place of honor at the California Surf Museum in Oceanside, California, a testament to Hamilton's unwavering courage and the triumph of the human spirit over the darkest depths of adversity. Aaron Ralston, born October 27, 1975, in Marion, Ohio, moved to Denver at 12. He attended Cherry Creek High School, learned skiing and backpacking, and earned degrees in mechanical engineering and French with a minor in piano from Carnegie Mellon University. After working as a mechanical engineer with Intel, he quit in 2002 to pursue mountaineering. Moving to Aspen, Colorado, Ralston aimed to climb all of Colorado's 14ers solo and during winter. In 2003, he survived a grade five avalanche on Resolution Peak, re-evaluating his risk management approach. This event inspired him to shift his life towards climbing mountains. In the spring of 2003, Aaron Ralston embarked on a solo canyoneering adventure through the desolate beauty of Blue John Canyon in eastern Wayne County, Utah. Unbeknownst to anyone, he ventured into the rugged terrain just south of the Horseshoe Canyon unit of Canyonlands National Park. As Ralston descended the lower stretches of the Slot Canyon, fate took a cruel turn. A massive boulder dislodged, crashing down and shattering his left hand before mercilessly pinning his right hand against the unforgiving canyon wall. Cut off from the world, he faced a grim reality. No one knew of his whereabouts, and he lacked the means to call for help. With a diminishing supply of water and a meagre ration of two burritos, Ralston's resilience was put to the test. Days turned into a relentless struggle as he attempted, in vain, to free his trapped arm from the 800-pound chockstone. The desolation of the canyon echoed his desperate efforts, with each passing day bringing him closer to a haunting decision. Facing imminent death, Ralston resolved to amputate his own arm. In a surreal sequence of events, he carved his name and a poignant farewell into the sandstone walls, capturing his final moments on a chilling videotape for his family. As the night descended, he braced himself for what seemed like an inevitable end. However, a hallucination, born from the depths of exhaustion, brought a glimmer of hope. A vision of a future with a child played out in his delirium, injecting him with an unexpected will to survive. Morning brought a shocking revelation. His arm had started decomposing. Driven by desperation, Ralston hatched a daring plan to break his own bones using torque against his trapped limb. In a harrowing hour, he amputated his forearm with a makeshift multi-tool using a dull knife and pliers. The ordeal, marked by excruciating pain, also showcased his resourcefulness as he used tubing from a camelback as a tourniquet. Liberated from the canyon's merciless grip, Ralston faced the daunting task of climbing out. He rappelled down a sheer 65-foot wall and hiked towards civilization, eight miles from his vehicle with no means of communication. Fate intervened when he encountered a vacationing Dutch family, Eric, Monique, and their son, Andy. Their timely assistance saved Ralston's life. Rescuers, alerted by Ralston's family, had narrowed down the search to Canyonlands. A helicopter lifted him to safety approximately four hours after the amputation. Ralston's severed arm, recovered later by park authorities, was cremated and the ashes were returned to him. In a poignant return to the canyon six months later, on his 28th birthday, Ralston scattered the ashes of his arm, symbolizing closure and resilience in the face of unimaginable odds. Within the enchanting tapestry of nature, animals unveil an unpredictable yet endearing allure. From the mysterious behaviors of wild creatures to the playful surprises of our domestic companions, their charm lies in the unexpected. On a quiet Quebec highway, an extraordinary event transpired, 
weaving a tapestry of tragedy and peculiarity. In the darkness, a speeding car collided with a formidable 440-pound black bear, launching the unsuspecting creature into a ghastly trajector. The airborne bear, a morbid projectile, crashed into an oncoming SUV, penetrating the front windshield and tearing through the vehicle before exiting out the back window. The aftermath revealed a scene of devastation, two lives extinguished, the 25-year-old female driver and a 40-year-old male passenger, while the driver's boyfriend miraculously escaped with minor injuries. The Pontiac Sunfire, the car responsible for the initial collision, added a surreal layer to the incident. Its low profile and aerodynamic design seemingly transformed a routine encounter with wildlife into a macabre event, leaving authorities to grapple with the perplexing circumstances. In Campbellton, New Brunswick, on August 5, 2013, two young brothers, Noah and Connor Bath, aged four and six, were visiting their friend's father's pet store, where they met a tragic end at the coils of an African rock python. The apartment above the pet store, where the boys peacefully slept, became an unexpected battleground between innocence and nature's capriciousness. The python, initially housed in a specially constructed enclosure, seized an opportunity to escape. Slithering through an air duct, it descended through a ceiling tile, entering the living room where the unsuspecting boys lay. Jean-Claude Savoie, the python's owner, later recounted the harrowing details. The snake, measuring over four meters in length and weighing 45 kilograms, struck silently. The encounter resulted in a devastating loss as the python constricted around the brothers in the darkened room. The bizarre circumstances sent through the town, prompting disbelief and grief. Controversy enveloped the tragic tale as experts debated the unusual behavior of the snake. Skepticism lingered, fueled by the fact that the snake did not consume the victims and the apparent lack of disturbance noticed by other occupants in the apartment. Despite objections, authorities ruled out foul play. The aftermath saw the python's euthanasia and a preliminary autopsy report confirming asphyxiation as the cause of death for the Bartha brothers. Amidst the grief, the community grappled with the revelation that the pet shop, registered as a reptile zoo, lacked the necessary permits for housing such creatures. As the legal proceedings unfolded, Savoy faced charges of criminal negligence for failing to prevent the tragic deaths. Travis, a chimpanzee with a unique background, entered the world at the Missouri Chimpanzee Sanctuary on October 21, 1995. His parents, Susie and Coco, had been brought to the US from Africa in the 1970s. Unfortunately, tragedy struck when Susie was fatally shot during an escape in 2001. Sandra and Jerome Herald became Travis's new caretakers, acquiring him for $50,000 from a breeder when he was just three days old. Naming him after Sandra's favorite singer, Travis Tritt, the Heralds raised him in their North Stamford home in Connecticut. Travis became an integral part of their lives, joining them on daily activities, including work at their towing company and local shopping trips. Accompanying the Heralds to the towing shop, Travis not only posed for photos, but also rode along in the tow truck, adorned in a baseball shirt with a securely buckled seatbelt. His presence became well known in the town, where he would even greet police officers during their encounters while towing cars. Travis's socialization extended beyond the confines of his upbringing, making him a familiar and engaging figure in his community. Travis's daily life became a captivating story of extraordinary abilities. From opening doors with keys to dressing himself, feeding horses, and even enjoying a seat at the family table with a stemmed glass of wine, Travis seamlessly blended into the Herald's routines. His love for ice cream and knack for keeping track of passing trucks showcased his charming quirks. A tech-savvy chimpanzee, Travis logged onto computers, 
watched TV with a remote control, and even brushed his teeth with a water pick. The narrative took a poignant turn when Sandra lost her only child in 2000 and Jerome succumbed to cancer in 2004. Travis, almost a surrogate son to Sandra, became an even more cherished companion. Their bond reached new heights as they shared sleeping and bathing routines. In 2003, Travis made headlines for escaping and causing a traffic disturbance. The incident led to a Connecticut law regulating the ownership of primates as pets, effective in 2009. The Heralds, exempted due to their long-term ownership, continued life with Travis. The year 2009 brought a tragic chapter as Travis attacked Sandra's friend, Charla Nash, on February 16th. Holding Harold's car keys, Travis encountered Nash holding his favorite toy, triggering a violent outburst. Despite Harold's desperate attempts to stop the attack, the rampage continued. Travis's tragic confrontation with the police ended in his death. The aftermath left Nash with devastating injuries, prompting legal battles and freezing of Harold's assets. The incident's impact extended to legislative discussions about private ownership of exotic animals. Sandra's sudden death in 2010, due to a ruptured aortic aneurysm, marked another tragic chapter. The story continued with Nash's journey to recovery, including a groundbreaking transplant surgery in 2011. Despite initial success, complications arose, highlighting the ongoing challenges faced by those affected by Travis's unforgettable tale. Joseph Austin Smith, a 32-year-old plumber from Wichita. Joseph, described as a devoted family man and skilled musician, found himself in a heartbreaking and fatal circumstance which would leave a community shattered. It was a Saturday morning, just before 10 a.m., when Joseph occupied the passenger seat of his friend's truck, nestled amidst the rolling landscapes of Gayuda Springs. The friends, united by a shared love for the outdoors, were on a mission to hunt doe, blissfully unaware of the somber twist that awaited them. In a cruel twist of fate, the gun in the back seat, part of their hunting gear, discharged. The echoes of the gunshot reverberated through the tranquil surroundings, marking the tragic moment when Joseph was struck in the back. First responders rushed to the scene, mere minutes away, but their efforts were in vain. The Sumner County Sheriff's Office, delving into the heart-wrenching details, revealed an unexpected culprit. A dog, a loyal companion belonging to the owner of the truck. The canine unwittingly triggered the rifle, leading to the fateful shot that claimed Joseph's life. The gun, it was noted, belonged to his friend, adding another layer of heartbreak to the unfolding narrative. As the investigation unfolded, the community grappled with the loss of Joseph, a man cherished by those who knew him. His boss, Chris Brown, owner of Brown Plumbing Services, attested to Joseph's ability to uplift spirits, even in the face of adversity. A GoFundMe page, a digital tapestry of shared grief and support, emerged to help his family navigate the challenging road ahead. Joseph's mother, in a poignant tribute, shared glimpses of her sweet Joe as a child, a mischievous spirit on a bike, and a budding guitarist. Friends painted a vivid portrait of a kind, funny, and loving individual whose mere presence could bring joy. Joseph, a skilled bass player in local bands, left an indelible mark on the Wichita music scene. Amidst the sorrow and questions lingering in the air, an investigation unfurled, entwining agencies like the Sumner County Sheriff's Office and the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks. As the rural landscape echoed with the solemn notes of a life extinguished too soon, the community sought solace in shared memories and the enduring legacy of a man whose untimely passing cast a somber shadow over the Kansas Plains. In the pursuit of personal well-being, the desire to smell good is a universal inclination. Fragrance becomes a form of self-expression, a subtle yet powerful means to boost confidence and leave a lasting impression. 
Whether through invigorating colognes or refreshing body sprays, the act of smelling good resonates as a simple pleasure, connecting individuals to a sense of cleanliness and allure. It's a small daily indulgence that brings joy and confidence to people's lives. 16-year-old Jonathan Capewell lost his life due to an excessive obsession with personal hygiene. Jonathan, hailing from Oldham, Greater Manchester, was found to have a shocking tenfold increase in the lethal levels of propane and butane in his bloodstream, substances commonly found in aerosol deodorants, serving as propellants that release the product in a fine mist. These hydrocarbon gases, due to their ability to exist in a liquefied state under pressure, facilitate the smooth and controlled dispensing of deodorant. Propane, with its quick vaporization, aids in the efficient spray mechanism, while butane contributes to the overall pressurization of the container. Jonathan's fixation on smelling good led him to douse his entire body in deodorant at least twice a day creating a hazardous environment within the confines of his bedroom. Tragically, the gases accumulated over months, resulting in a heart attack that claimed his life. His father, Keith Capewell, expressed disbelief, recounting how the pervasive scent of deodorant even reached other parts of their home. Even when we were in a room downstairs, we couldn't just smell it, we could taste it he shared, emphasizing the high price his son paid for his hygiene obsession. The coroner clarified that Jonathan was not engaged in substance abuse, but rather succumbed to the unintended consequences of excessive deodorant use. His personal hygiene led him to use more than was normal in a confined space which limits ventilation. The coroner, Barry Williams, recorded a verdict of accidental death shedding light on the unforeseen consequences of the teenager's relentless pursuit of freshness. Jonathan's mother, Louise, called for improved warnings on aerosol cans, urging companies to highlight the potential dangers alongside their enticing fragrances. You just get up in the morning and spray it on, but who expects it to kill you? She questioned, emphasizing the need for better consumer awareness. Jonathan's room bore witness to various brands of deodorant, including Lynx, Gillette, and Right Guard. Sue Rogers, representing the British Aerosol Manufacturing Association, expressed deep concern over the unprecedented nature of the incident and pledged urgent investigation. The circumstances of Jonathan's death are so unusual that it is difficult for us to make a further comment, but clearly, we are a responsible industry, and we will look into it with the utmost urgency to ensure that everything possible is done to maintain good practice," she stated. Snoring, caused by the vibration of airway structures during sleep, is a common occurrence. Factors like anatomy, nasal issues, sleep position, and excess weight contribute to its prevalence. While occasional snoring is normal, Persistent cases may indicate underlying problems. Consultation with a healthcare professional is recommended for evaluation and appropriate management. Knowledge Mark Gleason, wish he had known sooner. In an unusual twist, a 26-year-old man named Mark Gleason lost his life while attempting an unconventional solution for his persistent snoring. The incident took place in Haslemere, Surrey, Facing a discouraging prognosis from medical professionals regarding his snoring, Gleason and his girlfriend, Tracy Lambert, decided on a peculiar approach. He inserted tampons into his nostrils in an effort to stifle the disruptive nighttime noise. The decision was made after Gleason had some wine and took a few sleeping tablets. Their goal was to prevent disturbing the household with his snoring. Lambert left Gleason asleep on a sofa, only to discover the tragic outcome the following morning. Her partner lifeless with tampons inserted into his nose. Gleason's mother, Vera, explained that her son's snoring was attributed to sinus issues resulting from a previous road accident. Despite seeking medical advice, 
Gleason had been informed that little could be done to alleviate his condition. Pathologist Dr. Peter Jackson revealed that Gleason's death on January 23rd was caused by asphyxiation, partly due to the tampons, with the sleeping tablets likely exacerbating his breathing difficulties. In a solemn conclusion, Coroner Michael Burgess recorded the verdict of accidental death. On the 2nd of April 2021, a disastrous and inconceivable incident took place. This event would drag a loving family's life into turbulence and become one of Ireland's most sorrowful events. In the intimate city of Dublin, where the streets are filled with vibrant art and historic buildings, lived a promising and cheerful eight-year-old named Luke Ramon Harper. Luke, despite being diagnosed with ADHD and autism, both neurological and developmental disorders, maintained a very happy and playful nature. On the sorrowful day of the 2nd of April, Luke had been playing in his bedroom and watching YouTube videos. As his mother was downstairs preparing dinner shortly before 5pm, she called Luke and his sister, Ella, to come and eat. However, to her surprise, Luke had not responded and upstairs was unusually quiet. She went upstairs to find out why Luke wasn't coming down. She was shocked to discover Luke lying face down on the ground in an unresponsive state, with a balloon completely over his head. Luke's body was described as limp as she pulled the balloon off his face and took him outside to get some fresh air. Luke's father, Martin Harper, assisted her by giving Luke chest compressions while they waited for the ambulance to arrive. Ms. McSweeney recounted the heartbreaking sequence of events leading to the loss of her son during the inquest. She expressed that she sensed trouble as paramedics diligently worked on Luke in the garden, ultimately transporting him to the hospital via ambulance. While in the hospital, the devastating news arrived that Luke had suffered a cardiac arrest and it became apparent that his brain had sustained severe damage, necessitating life support. Reflecting on the excruciating decision to say goodbye, Ms. McSweeney described taking mementos of Luke through his hair, handprint and footprint. Luke passed away surrounded by his family, lying on his bed with his favorite blanket and teddy bear. The official pronouncement of his death occurred at 3.52 p.m. on April 2, 2021. In a heart-wrenching moment, Ms. McSweeney conveyed the overwhelming numbness, heartbreak and unimaginable pain she experienced. Describing Luke as an excellent son, confident and full of love, she emphasised the profound loss. In response to queries from the coroner, Croner Gallagher, Ms. McSweeney clarified that Luke had always had helium balloons at his birthday parties, with no prior incidents or attempts to place a balloon over his head. She termed the tragedy a complete freak accident. Luke's father, Mr. Harper, remarked that Luke likely didn't realize the potential dangers of inhaling helium, believing he was simply attempting to reinflate the balloon before losing consciousness. The post-mortem revealed Luke's cause of death, a lack of oxygen to the brain due to a cardiac arrest induced by inhaling helium from a partially deflated balloon. Dr. Gallagher noted the rapid and severe brain damage suffered by Luke, describing it as an insurmountable injury. While reluctant to make recommendations due to the unprecedented nature of the incident, Dr. Gallagher highlighted the dangers of helium, emphasizing that even a small amount could cause harm. She stressed the importance of awareness, but did not discourage the use of helium balloons at celebrations. Dr. Gallagher returned a verdict of accidental death offering condolences to Luke's family. The grieving parents, speaking after the hearing, expressed their anxiety for other families to be aware of the potential danger of helium balloons, particularly with younger children, emphasizing the importance of proper disposal. The tragedy surrounding Thomas Anthony Mansfield's untimely death unfolded against the backdrop of a routine morning in Colwyn Bay. As a personal trainer and security guard, Mr Mansfield was dedicated to maintaining a healthy lifestyle. 
typically limiting his daily coffee intake to a modest two cups. On the morning of January 5th, 2021, Mr. Mansfield awaited the arrival of a packet of caffeine powder from Blackburn Distributions, a renowned UK-based sports supplement company. Little did he know that this ordinary delivery would culminate in a devastating misadventure. Armed with aspirations of a mid-range serving, Mr. Mansfield's fatal error lay in the use of a digital scale with a starting weight of two grams. This oversight led him to ingest a substantial amount of caffeine powder, far exceeding the recommended dosage of 60 to 300 millimeters twice a day. Shortly after consuming the pre-workout drink, Mr. Mansfield's health took a drastic turn. Experiencing chest pain, he sought refuge on the sofa, where he was soon discovered by his wife, Susanna. Panic set in as Mr. Mansfield began frothing at the mouth, prompting Susanna to urgently seek help from nearby neighbors and family. The swift arrival of an ambulance marked the beginning of resuscitation attempts, driven by Mr. Mansfield's grossly abnormal heart rhythm. Despite the valiant efforts of the emergency responders, the decision to cease resuscitation attempts came at 4 p.m., signaling the tragic end of a life that held promise and vitality. In the aftermath, Coroner John Gittins characterized Mr. Mansfield's death as a misadventure, acknowledging that it resulted from the unintended consequences of his own actions. However, amidst the sorrow, a glimmer of reassurance emerged. The coroner acknowledged the steps taken by Blackburn Distributions to prevent future tragedies, including the introduction of a scoop and an A4 instruction sheet in all new packets. The absence of these crucial measures at the time underscored the potentially life-saving role they might have played. The coroner emphasized that, while the instructions and warnings on the caffeine powder packet adhered to regulations, it still served as a reminder of the dangers that can accompany our daily routines. In the vibrant tapestry of Hollywood, the captivating presence of John Eric Hexham an American actor and model, illuminated screens with his lead roles in TV series such as Voyagers and Cover Up. Born on November 5, 1957, in Englewood, New Jersey, Hexham's journey seamlessly intertwined academia and the allure of the entertainment industry. Following his graduation from Tenafly High School, Hexham embarked on an academic pursuit initially studying biomedical engineering at Case Western Reserve University. Hexham's acclaim soared with the lead role in the 1982-1983 NBC TV series Voyagers as Phineas Bogg, a former pirate turned time traveler. His star continued to rise as he shared the screen with Joan Collins in the made-for-television movie Making of a Male Model and later took on the role of Mac Harper an undercover CIA operative posing as a model, opposite Jennifer O'Neill in the CBS primetime series Cover Up in 1984. Tragically, on October 12, 1984, while filming the seventh episode of Cover Up, titled Golden Opportunity on the 20th Century Fox Lot, Hexham's life took an unexpected turn. A scene required him to load cartridges into a 44 Magnum handgun leading to a playful moment that culminated in him simulating Russian roulette with a blank cartridge. Unbeknownst to him, the explosive effect of the muzzle blast caused severe blunt force trauma, fracturing a quarter-sized piece of his skull. Rushed to Beverly Hills Medical Center, Hexham underwent a five-hour surgery to address his critical injuries. Despite the medical efforts, he was declared brain dead on October 18, 1984, at the young age of 26. In a poignant gesture, his mother permitted the donation of his organs, including his heart, kidneys and corneas, offering a glimmer of hope and life to those in need. Hexham's body was flown to San Francisco on life support, where his heart found a new home in a 36-year-old man at California Pacific Medical Center. His kidneys and corneas were also donated, providing the gift of life to recipients ranging from a critically ill five-year-old boy to a 43-year-old grandmother 
who had waited eight years for a kidney. The skin donation contributed to treating a two-year-old boy with third-degree burns. After this selfless act, Hexum's body returned to Los Angeles, where he was cremated in Glendale, California. A private funeral was held, and his ashes were scattered in the Pacific Ocean near Malibu, as per his mother's wishes. Jomar Junko, a hard-working and ambitious 18-year-old, commenced on a new chapter of his life at a factory. Having joined the workforce merely two weeks ago, he found himself entangled in the intricate web of machinery that fueled the production of spicy chorizo. It was the morning of June the 22nd when misfortune entered his life. The factory hummed with the rhythmic sounds of production as Joe Mar, driven by curiosity, attempted to reach something inside the machine. The machinery, however, was still in full swing. The consequences were catastrophic. Around 7.30 a.m., the factory's floor became the stage for a torturous incident. Joe Mar was pulled into the ruthless gears of the machine as he met a grievous end. His spiritless body remained undiscovered until 8 a.m., prompting the arrival of emergency services an hour later. Corporal Jennifer Espora, involved in the investigation, shared, We asked his co-workers and the owner of the company, and they claimed he was alone in the working area when the incident occurred. It is possible that he was curious about the other machine, so he was looking around the other stations. As the narrative unfolded, Carl Davis Carlos, a former colleague of Jomar's, shed some light on the possible sequence of the events. Jomar, it seemed, had unwittingly ventured too close to the operating blades of the machine. The powerful two horsepower motor came to a halt midway, with half of Jomar's body trapped inside. His colleague, quick to respond, managed to extricate him from the machine, emphasising that Jomar's designated station was in an entirely different room. Although Jomar's body was recovered intact, the extraction process required technicians to partially disassemble the machine. Sadness hanged over the factory as the local authorities awaited autopsy results to unravel the mystery behind Jomar's untimely demise. Funeral director R.D. Poraz hinted at the possibility of suffocation, adding another layer to this sad event. The owner of the Frozen Foods Company, Jocela Jaleco, expressed deep regret, revealing that she had previously cautioned Jomar against placing his hands inside the machine. In the quiet streets of the Turkish city of Ezerum, a unusual tale disclosed. Interlaced with desperation, a 24-year-old named Zafer Kuzu, sentenced to community service for an offence categorised as wounding, sought a bizarre escape from his fate. With a desire to sidestep the remaining duration of his sentence, Kuzu hatched a peculiar plan, enlisting the help of two friends identified as FY and FYT. He strapped two pillows to his back, convinced that this makeshift armour would shield him from the consequence of a shotgun blast. The trio caught in a misguided endeavour chose a shotgun as their tool for their attempted hospitalisation. Unaware of the potential lethality at close range due to the spread of inner pellets within the casing, they believed the pillows would serve as a sufficient barrier against the penetrating force of the shotgun slugs. As the scene unfolded, one of Kuzu's friends fired the fatal shot at close range, seriously injuring Kuzu. Panic set in as his friends rushed him to a nearby hospital, but Kuzu died before they could leave the confines of their dwelling. The aftermath saw the arrival of law enforcement responding to the bizarre circumstances that led to the untimely demise. FYT and the alleged shooter, 18-year-old FY, were promptly arrested. 
The authorities seized the shotgun as evidence and dispatched Kuzu's body to the Forensic Medicine Institute in Istanbul for a detailed autopsy. In the aftermath of the incident, the two suspects underwent rigorous interrogations before being presented in court. FY was found guilty and remanded while FYT secured release on bail. The death of Elaine Herzberg on March the 18th, 2018 marked a historic milestone as the first recorded pedestrian fatality involving a self-driving car. The incident occurred late in the evening in Arizona when Herzberg, pushing a bicycle across a four-lane road, was struck by an Uber test vehicle operating in self-drive mode. A human safety backup driver was present in the driving seat. Transported to a local hospital, Herzberg died, prompting a thorough investigation by the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB. In response to the findings, the NTSB issued critical recommendations and censored Uber. Consequently, Uber suspended self-driving vehicle testing in Arizona where it had been permitted since August 2016. The company also opted not to renew its California testing permit, which expired at the end of March 2018. Uber eventually resumed testing in December 2018. In March 2019, Arizona prosecutors absolved Uber of criminal responsibility for the crash while the backup driver faced charges of negligent homicide. Herzberg's death was the first recorded incident of a pedestrian fatality caused by a self-driving car. On April the 10th, 2018, a 16-year-old Kyle Plush lost his life due to asphyxiation inside a Honda Odyssey. The incident took place in the parking lot of his school in Cincinnati, Ohio, marking a devastating chapter in his young life. What started as a simple task of retrieving his tennis equipment quickly turned into a harrowing ordeal. Unknown to Kyle, leaning over the third row of seats towards the trunk would prove to be a fatal decision. The seats compressed, trapping him and leading to his asphyxiation. In an attempt to seek help, Kyle dialed 911 twice, using his smartphone's voice assistant to relay his distress. Unfortunately, his calls went unanswered and the responding police faced challenges in locating him in the vastness of the school's parking lot. As time passed, each moment amplified the anguish felt by those waiting for news. After six agonizing hours, it was Carl's father who made the heartbreaking discovery, finding his lifeless son within the confines of the vehicle. In the bustling city of Taegu, South Korea, a story unfolded that sent shockwaves through the gaming community and beyond. It all began for a 28-year-old man, known only by his family name, Lee. He was an avid gamer drawn to the virtual worlds of online computer games, but his passion would soon lead him down a tragic path. Lee's tale began on a summer's day, August the 3rd, when he embarked on an extraordinary gaming journey. He entered an internet cafe, a haven for gamers seeking uninterrupted hours of play, and there he sat down to play the popular game StarCraft. Little did he know that this gaming session would extend for a staggering 50 consecutive hours. As he immersed himself in the captivating digital universe of StarCraft, Lee paid little attention to the needs of his physical body. He had barely slept and had hardly eaten throughout this gaming marathon. The cafe became his world, the pixels on the screen his reality. South Korea, a nation with a lightning fast and widespread broadband connection, was no stranger to the allure of online multiplayer gaming. In this country, gaming has transcended mere entertainment. It had become a way of life. Professional gamers were not only rewarded with substantial sponsorships, but some were even taking in more than 100,000 a year. Lee, like many others, was ensnared by the virtual realm. 
unable to resist the call of the game. The hours turned into days and Lee's health deteriorated. He paused briefly for nature's call and grabbed a few minutes of fitful sleep, but he couldn't tear himself away from the game for long. It was during one of these sleep-deprived moments that disaster struck. Lee collapsed, his body was weakened by fatigue and malnutrition. News of this tragic incident quickly spread, capturing the attention of South Korean authorities. It was in their grim duty to inform the world that Lee's cause of death was likely heart failure as a result of extreme exhaustion. He was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. Lee's life was extinguished, leaving behind a void that couldn't be filled. This heartbreaking incident underscored the darker side of the gaming world, where passion could turn into obsession and ultimately tragedy. Lee's family revealed that he had recently lost his job because of his persistent gaming. Online computer games were experiencing a meteoric rise in popularity and stories of individuals spending from 10 to 15 hours a day in virtual worlds were becoming all too common. Experts cautioned players to take regular screen breaks and the allure of these immersive experiences often proved irresistible. South Korea with over 15 million registered online gamers, equivalent to 30% of the population, was a testament to the power of the gaming world. In this nation, gaming was more than just a pastime, it was a culture, an industry, and in some cases, a perilous obsession. A tragic and bizarre incident unfolded in a quiet corner of San Jose del Balque, eastern Argentina, where the lifeless body of a 58-year-old shepherd named Jose Alberto was discovered in his home. The circumstances were deeply unsettling as neighbours had reported an unusual and putrid odour emanating from the residence. Concerned by the stench, the police were compelled to investigate. What they encountered within those walls left them dumbfounded. As they entered the dwelling, they found Mr. Alberto's lifeless form. Beside him lay a scarecrow, inexplicably transformed into a peculiar resemblance of a woman. The scarecrow had been adorned with a long-haired wig, lipstick, and an affixed strap-on device. Rodolfo Moore, the spokesperson for the prosecutor's office, recounted the perplexing scene, stating, I initially thought that there were two bodies, but then I realised one was a scarecrow wearing lipstick and a long-haired wig. It was lying next to the deceased and had a six-inch appendage. Intriguingly, no signs of violence were evident, leaving the investigators to grapple with a perplexing mystery. They are currently operating under the assumption that Mr Alberta may have met an unfortunate demise during an intimate encounter with the dressed scarecrow. In the vibrant city of Dusseldorf, Germany, where the spirit of athletics and competition filled the air, a spine-chilling incident unfolded. It was a day marked by both promise and tragedy. The backdrop was an athletics event, a testament to human strength and endurance, where the athletes and officials came together to celebrate the beauty of physical achievement. Among them, a 74-year-old official named Dieter Strack, whose dedication and experience had earned him the respect and admiration of all who knew him. One fateful Sunday, the sun cast a warm glow over the stadium. Dieter Strack was carrying out his duties as an official, overseeing the throws of javelin, a discipline that demanded precision and technique. As he ventured forward to measure a throw, little did he know that destiny had something cruel in store. A javelin hurled with force and determination by a 15-year-old competitor was on its trajectory towards the ground. It was a moment when time seemed to slow as the pointed end of the javelin found an unintended target, the throat of Mr. Strack. The stadium, once filled with chairs and applause, fell into a sudden silence as the reality of the situation unfurled. The immediate response was swift as Mr. Strack was rushed to the hospital, hope and prayers accompanying him on his journey. However, the injuries he sustained in that heart-wrenching instant proved unsurmountable. The world of athletics had lost one of its own. The competition, once filled with dreams and victory, was abruptly called off. It wasn't just Mr. Strack who was affected. The 15-year-old competitor whose javelin found an unintended target was left traumatised by the incident. 
Psychological counselling was offered to him as authorities grappled with the aftermath. The local athletics association released a statement identifying the fallen official as Mr Strat. Their words echoed the sentiments of all who had the privilege of knowing him. He was a much loved and experienced sports judge, a man who had dedicated himself to the pursuit of fairness and excellence in the world of athletics. All of us who were there and horrified in shock, we will always remember Dieter Strack. The statement concluded, a tribute to the life lost in the service of sport. On the fateful day of October the 26th, 2020, Christopher Bullock, a seasoned police chief in San Jose, Philippines, encountered a tragic and unusual turn of events while immersed in the day-to-day -day responsibilities of law enforcement. Christopher was diligently working on a case involving illegal gambling during an anti-gambling raid. The suspect in question were entangled in the old age and illicit activity of cockfighting. Cockfighting, a brutal blood sport, involved putting two roosters or gamecocks against each other in a confined arena. These birds are equipped with sharp blades, intensifying the ferocity of the battle and often leading to severe injuries, incapacitation or death. The twisted allure of cockfighting draws participants seeking entertainment and engaging in gambling activities. In the midst of carrying out his duties to break up the cockfighting match, disaster struck for Christopher Bollock. A rooster armed with a blade attached to its leg for combat lashed out at him. The blade slashed through Christopher's leg, severing his femoral artery and unleashing a torrent of blood. Sadly, this grievous injury proved fatal, leading to Christopher bleeding to death in the line of duty. In a sad turn of events, a man named Darren Hickey met his untimely demise after an unfortunate encounter with an exceptionally hot fish cake. The incident unfolded when the 51-year-old wedding planner was offered a fish cake to sample by a chef at a wedding venue on April the 4th. Little did Mr Hickey know that the seemingly innocuous culinary experience would take a fatal turn. The intensity of the fish cake's heat left his throat scorched initiating a chain of events that would ultimately lead to his demise. Over the course of the next 12 hours, Mr Hickey's voice box began to swell, gradually escalating to a point where it impeded his ability to breathe. Faced with worsening pain, Mr Hickey sought medical attention at the urgent care of Shirley Hospital in Lancashire. Inquest revealed a disconcerting aspect of the case, casting a spotlight on the care provided by the hospital. Despite the severity of his condition, Mr Hickey was reportedly sent home with paracetamol, a decision that the coroner deemed questionable. As the pain persisted, the impediment to Mr Hickey's breathing and swallowing became increasingly severe due to the swelling. A pathologist who conducted a post-mortem examination noted the rarity of such a case, typically only observed in individuals who have experienced smoke inhalation during house fires resulting in airway burns. He elaborated on the unusual nature of the situation. Patients in such cases can suddenly experience swelling, leading to respiratory distress. The sad incident raises not only questions about the circumstances surrounding Mr Hickey's passing, but also the concerns about the adequacy of medical care provided. The vibrant life of Margaret Moura, a 21-year-old senior, at Tulane University was abruptly cut short at a Mississippi Highway rest stop on a fateful Tuesday afternoon. Margaret, affectionately known as Meg, had embarked on a spring break trip with friends, creating memories that will soon be overshadowed by an unimaginable accident. The group had paused at a rest area of Interstate 10 eastbound near Gutierre, Mississippi, blissfully unaware of the impending catastrophe. Simultaneously, a massive 18-wheeler journeying westbound on the highway experienced an inexplicable mishap. One of its rare dual tyres dislodged. The consequences of this seemingly routine event spiralled into tragedy when the colossal pair of tyres, each weighing approximately 500 pounds and securely bolted together, became airborne projectiles. 
they traversed the median strip and eastbound lanes with a forceful trajectory that led them to the unsuspecting rest area of the parking lot. It was here that Meg, in the midst of a leisurely walk back to her car with friends, fell victim to this bizarre turn of events. The tyres travelling an astonishing 850 feet collided with Meg, causing immediate and irreparable harm. Despite the prompt arrival of emergency responders, Margaret Moura was pronounced dead at the scene, leaving a void in the lives of those who knew her. The sudden loss reverberates as a collective heartbreak, underscoring the unforeseen and arbitrary nature of such incidents. In a tragic tale that unfolded over the course of nearly a decade, the life of Sam Ballard, a once vibrant 19 year old from Sydney, Australia, took an unforeseeable turn during a birthday party there in 2010. What started as a seemingly harmless act, eating a slug as part of a dare turned into a life altering catastrophe for Sam. Little did he know that the slug harbored the insidious rat lungworm setting in motion a chain of events that would profoundly impact his life and those around him. Sam, an avid rugby player with a zest for life, soon found himself grappling with the dire consequences of his impulsive decision. The slug he ingested was infected with a rat lungworm, a parasitic nematode commonly found in rodents. This parasite, typically benign in its natural host, passed its larvae into the animal's feces. However, in an unexpected twist, the consequences of Sam's seemingly harmless dare were far-reaching and devastating. The rat lungworm infection triggered a rare and severe strand of meningitis. Sam's body, unprepared for the assault of this formidable illness, succumbs to the infection plunging him into a coma that would last a staggering 420 days. While most individuals might recover from meningitis, Sam faced an exceptionally challenging battle as the infection had taken a toll on his brain. Emerging from his coma, Sam confronted a harsh reality. He was now a paraplegic, paralyzed from the waist down. The once active rugby player was confined to a wheelchair, navigating a world that had dramatically transformed for him. Over the years, Sam valiantly faced a series of medical complications resulting from his condition. Each day brought new challenges and hurdles as he and his loved ones grappled with the ongoing repercussions of that ill-fated day. Despite the unwavering support of his family and friends, Sam's health continued to decline and on a quiet Friday at the age of 28, he succumbed to the enduring complication that stemmed from the lung-induced infection. In the peaceful village of Liberty, nestled amidst the rolling hills of Sullivan County, New York, a quiet Sunday morning was about to take an unexpected turn. It was a day like any other, the world seemingly unchanged, but little did the Peckney family know that their lives were about to be forever altered. In the heart of this tight-knit community, Christopher Peckney, a 28-year-old father-to-be, and his younger brother, Michael Peckney, 27, had embarked on a creative endeavour that was meant to bring joy and excitement to their lives. The Peckney family was eagerly anticipating a gender reveal party a momentous occasion where they would unveil the long-awaited secret of their impending edition. As the clock neared noon, the brothers were diligently working on a special prop that would be the centerpiece of their gender reveal celebration. It was an explosive prop designed to ignite the day with a burst of colour and excitement, a symbol of the love and anticipation they felt for their unborn child. The prop was meant to be a prototype, a practice run to ensure everything would go smoothly when the actual gender reveal took place. Unbeknownst to them, this innocent endeavour would soon lead to an unforgettable tragedy. With the sun shining brightly overhead, the Peckney brothers carefully assembled the prop, 
unaware of the fate that lurked in the background. Their excitement filled the air as they envisioned the smiles, chairs and tears of joy that would accompany their gender reveal party. Then, in the unforeseeable twist of fate, disaster struck. The prop, which had been designed to solely bring happiness, suddenly detonated with a deafening explosion. Christopher Peckney, the expectant father filled with dreams and hope, was taken from this world in an instant. His brother Michael was left injured and bewildered by the devastating turn of events. State police rushed to the scene, their hearts heavy with the weight of the tragedy that unfolded. Trooper Stephen Neville, who arrived to investigate the accident, could not fathom the irony of the situation. The prop, intended to carry a message of love and joy, had instead brought grief. It wasn't meant to harm anyone, Neville would later explain to NBC News. His voice tinged with sadness. It was just an innocent prop for a gender reveal that went horribly wrong. As the hours passed, the bomb squad initiated their investigation. Questions swirled about the materials Christopher Peckney had intended to use, a haunting reminder of the unanswered inquiries surrounding this heart-wrenching incident. In the small town of Shropshire lived a man named Alex Mitchell. He was an ordinary man in many ways, leading a simple life with a loving wife, Nessie, by his side. But as fate would have it, Alex was destined for an extraordinary end. It was a quiet evening in the Mitchell household. Much like any other, Alex and Nessie were relaxing in their cosy living room, enjoying the warmth of a crackling fireplace. The television was their faithful companion, and that evening, it was turned onto a popular British comedy show known as The Goodies. As the episodes unfolded, the room echoed with laughter, the trio of comedians on screen, Tim Brooke Taylor, Graham Garden and Bill Oddy had a way of tickling the funny bone and Alex was particularly susceptible to their humour. He laughed heartedly, tears streaming down his face, his infectious laughter filling the room. But as the minutes passed, something extraordinary happened. Alex's laughter, once a source of joy, began to take a darker turn. He couldn't stop. His laughter intensified, becoming almost maniacal. Nessie watched in shock and terror as her husband's uncontrollable laughter continued. She tried to calm him down, but it was as if he had been seized by some invisible force. The minutes turned into an eternity and Alex's laughter showed no signs of stopping. And then, in an instant, it all stopped. The room fell into an airy silence and Alex slumped in his chair, lifeless. Nessie, grief-stricken and bewildered, reached out for help. She sent a letter to the very comedians who had unwittingly triggered her husband's bizarre and fatal episode. Thanking them for bringing joy to Alex's final moments, it was a strange twist of fate that would soon make headlines across the country. 37 years passed and the Ecky Fum episode of The Goodies remained etched into the collective memory of those who had witnessed it. The mystery of Alex Mitchell's death continued to baffle doctors and experts who were left with more questions than answers. And then, one day a group of medical professionals uncovered a new lead. They began to piece together the puzzle, attempting to understand the enigma that had confounded them for so long. After a thorough investigation and research, they reached a startling conclusion. It turned out that Alex Mitchell's death was not a mere coincidence. The constant and prolonged laughter had triggered a fatal chain of events. In those final moments, his heart had laboured beyond its limits. The laughter-induced stress of a cardiovascular system had led to a sudden and catastrophic heart failure. The revelation of this discovery added yet another layer to the legacy of Alex Mitchell and his fateful encounter with the goodies. In the beautiful island of Hawaii, a fisherman named Randy Lanes embarked on a fateful journey. Randy, a 47-year-old boat captain from Kona, was intimately familiar with the flow of the sea, a master of its depths. One Friday morning, under the brilliant Hawaiian sun, Randy's keen eye spotted a young broadbill swordfish, its sleek form slicing through the waters of the harbour. 
the shimmering fish held its gaze and in that moment he made a decision. He grasped his trusty spare gun, determined to bring this majestic creature aboard his vessel. With precision and skill, Randy took aim and let the spare fly, striking the swordfish. The battle was not yet over. In a sudden unexpected turn, the swordfish's powerful bill, about three feet long, found its mark. Randy felt an excruciating pain as the swordfish's bill impaled him in his upper chest. The startling turn of events left him grappling with the very creature he had sought to catch. With the swordfish's resistance relentless, Randy's fellow fishermen rushed to his aid. They pulled him out of the water, his chest wounded, his strength diminishing. CPR was administered, a desperate attempt to bring him back from the brink. But it was in vain. The young broadbill swordfish, weighing around 40 pounds and measuring 3 feet in length, had delivered a fatal blow. 